Well, I have some good news and some bad news. Now, the good news is, the good news is that nothing lasts forever. Now, that's very, very good news if we're talking about passing a kidney stone, right? <laughs> Anybody done that? Or if we're talking about our current political environment, um, or maybe my talk tonight. But the bad news is also nothing lasts forever, and that, that applies to democracy. In this case, liberal representative democracy or constitutional republics. You probably all know the story about Benjamin Franklin when he was leaving the Constitutional Convention. A woman came up to him and said, well, what did you give us? And Benjamin Franklin said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And Ronald Reagan said something similar, the freedom was always only one generation away from extinction. But I'm not sure we ever believed that. I'm not sure we took those warnings seriously, or at least not until recently. And I think one of the things that we've learned as Americans is that we are not immune to history. That a lot of the things that we thought were exceptional and solid turn out to be a lot more fragile, a lot thinner. There was a recent survey that found that a majority of Americans are not sure they have faith in democracy. Now, I want to talk about fake news and what it means to live in a post-truth world in, in just a moment, but I want to put all of this in some context, because historically, constitutional democracy, constitutional republics, whatever term you like, are not the norm. Over the sweep of human history, tribalism, authoritarianism, oligarchy, monarchy, tyranny, are pretty much the default setting of human culture. And liberal democracy is the exception and it's the antidote. But it relies on certain norms that are vitally important. Respect for the rule of law, respect for the rights of the minority, checks and balances, the ability to compromise, to deal with people who disagree with you. And central to this is the concept of responsible citizenship. Responsible citizenship. And I think that we have a crisis of democracy today because we have a crisis of citizenship. There was a recent poll that found that more than a third of Americans cannot name a single right guaranteed in the First Amendment, not one. A quarter of Americans cannot identify the three branches of government. But obviously, being a citizen is more than about, more than just knowledge. It's about certain values and distinct traits, including the respect for truth. Because truth is the oxygen of democracy. Democracy requires a functioning marketplace of ideas. The belief that there are facts, the truth is knowable, that we live in a shared reality. And the glue of democracy is trust, trust in one another, trust in that what we know and that what we hear is in fact true, which brings us to the moment we're in right now. Now, politicians who lie and who rely on propaganda are not new. What might be new for America is a citizenry that hears lies, knows they might not be true, and doesn't care. And that's the challenge of democracy. Because if we don't, if, if we don't have a shared reality, then there's no role for persuasion, and politics just becomes about brute force. I win, you lose. In winner-take-all politics, the first casualty is truth. The first casualty is always truth. Now, at one time, really not that long ago, we did have guardrails in our politics. Now, they didn't always work. They didn't always work, but they limited the impact of the most reckless and dishonest voices in our politics. And those guardrails are gone. And the result is that we are awash in fabulism, fake news, propaganda, conspiracy theories, doctored videos, lies, some of them coming from the highest reaches of American political life. And I'm pulling my punches here. And the question is, what do we do about that? How do we deal in that particular 
realm. Now, before we go any further, I want to say when I say fake news, I don't mean news that I don't like. One of the worst things that we've seen is that blurring of the distinction between fake news and just stuff that, 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 anno that annoys me. So when I say fake news, I don't mean news that I don't like. I mean things <clears throat> that are made up, that are fabricated, complete hoaxes. Because, and one of the things, unfortunately, what we've learned is that lying works. It generates clicks, ratings, votes. Lying can, in fact, be a very profitable business model, but it is an existential threat to democracy. Now, George Orwell, the author of 1984, wrote extensively about the relationship of truth and democracy and freedom. And he wrote the very concept of objective truth is fading out of the world. Lies will enter history. And one of the people that I've had a chance to meet in the course of my career was Gary Kasparov, the former world chess champion and Russian dissident, who makes an important point. He says, look, the point of propaganda in an authoritarian regime is not just to mislead you and to push an agenda. It is to attack your critical sensibilities, to annihilate truth. And his point is that the flood of alternative facts isn't just to make you think that black is white. It's to make you question, who do I believe? What do I believe? What is truth? And like Pontius Pilate, not wait around for an answer. Now, in a world in which nobody knows what's true, what's real, people look to the leader or the state. Now, that's very familiar in an authoritarian regime, but it's a rather radical departure for American democracy. And so this fight over truth is central to our politics these days. And one of the other writers who wrote about this, who wrote about the death of democracy, the death of freedom, was Hannah Arendt in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. And she described a world in which people were willing to believe everything and nothing, to think that everything was possible and nothing was true, that the public got to the point where they would believe the worst, no matter how improbable or absurd, and they didn't particularly mind when they realized they were being lied to because they believed that everything was a lie. Everything was a lie. Well, everybody lies. Well, what about so-and-so? And her point, again, is the same as Gary Kasparov's point, that this tsunami of lies will lead to this sort of despairing shrug, this breakdown of caring that people just give up. And she pointed out that the ideal subject of the totalitarian state is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist. It's the person for whom there is no longer really a distinction between fact and fiction, between lies and truth. Now, obviously, we can't have this discussion of a post-truth world without talking about social media and the world of social media. There's a Pew survey that found that two-thirds of us get our news now from Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. In other words, yeah, great. Yeah, uh, we, have, we, have, we have outsourced our search for truth to other people, and we know how it works, right? We know how social media works. Social media gives us what we want. It gives us the facts we want. And in many ways, it will protect us from things we don't want to see. So along with cable television, people like you know, Fox News, um, MSNBC, and I'm a contributor there, we create these huge echo chambers that really become these alternative reality silos that can become incubators for false stories and information. Because in these silos, a false story is almost, lies are almost impossible to refute because people wall themselves off. For a lot of people, these alternative reality silos are the safe spaces where they hear things that confirm their bias and they protect themselves from information that might challenge their premise. Now, I could spend the rest of the time talking about social media, and there's certainly a lot of things that we could talk about. I mean, look, I think there are legitimate complaints about the bias of the mainstream media, and Lord knows I've made them over the years, but somehow, at some point, we went too far, and we delegitimized many of the fact-based media, and as a result, we destroyed folks' immunity to hoaxes and bad information, which brings us again to this moment. But I don't think that it's fair to blame the media totally for all of this. 
there are a lot of tweaks the media can make. Technical tweaks are possible. Tweaking human nature is much more difficult. And maybe the problem is not them, it's us. Now, I think a lot of us assume that human beings use their minds and their reason to determine what is true. But a lot of social psychologists say this misunderstands the way that we are wired. And there's a fantastic book called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, who describes this process. And he said, you know, if you understand the tribal nature of human beings, you need to understand that a lot of people use their reasoning not to determine what is right or what is wrong, but what will strengthen my bond to my tribe? What will give me the conclusion that I want? In fact, he cites studies that say that a hyperpartisan who hears information about their political party or their candidate they like will actually literally get a dose of dopamine, which would suggest that hyperpartisanship is literally addictive. And the social psychologist will say, that human beings, if they want to believe something, they only need one piece of information. One piece of information to believe what they, whatever conspiracy theory. And the flip side is that they also only need one thing, one piece of data, if they don't want to believe something. Now, imagine how easy this is in a world in which we're always one click away or one swipe away from protecting ourselves from any information we don't want to hear one click away, one swipe away from having all of our biases confirmed. So many of us have walled ourselves off in these alternative reality silos that we can protect ourselves against information, including the fact that, hey, your guy has just told a lie, and lies are entering into history. This is what G.K. Chesterton once described, though, as the clean, well-lit prison of one idea. So what do we do about this? It suggests that, that the solution, if there is a solution, lies not only with the media, but with us and with our culture. And the reality is that, and we have to step back from all of this, that you can always say it's them, but we are paying a tremendous price for our failure in this country to educate young people in civics and in media literacy. And it's going to take a massive effort on the part of this country, I think, to turn that around, maybe along the level of what we did in the 1950s after the Soviets launched Sputnik. Remember that? Where Americans said, oh my gosh, we need to begin uh, teaching science and mathematics. Well, maybe in this moment, we need to teach civics and media literacy. And by civics, I mean history, the values of the, the country, how government works, how the system is supposed to work, media literacy. How do you navigate a world in which you are flooded with so much information and news? How do you determine the difference between hoaxes and, uh, and, and, and true in, information? You know, in a, and also, teach people then how to be not only digitally literate, but also to be citizens. Now, I'm not putting the whole burden here on the American educational system. There's a lot of things that we can do as well. Every one of us, you. You can stop spreading garbage, for example. Like, do not forward that chain email from your crazy uncle. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. We need fact checkers. We need conservative media to fact check conservatives. We need liberal media to fact check liberals. We also need to hold our politicians to a higher standard, including the politicians you agree with. We need to hold politicians to the same standard you would hold anyone else you deal, deal with in your daily life. You would not do business with somebody who lied to you on a regular basis, I hope. So the question is, why would we have higher standards for car salesmen than for the President of the United States? Now, no. No disrespect, no disrespect, by the way, to car salesmen there. <laughs> but most important, we have to relearn what it means to be a citizen of this country, to realize that we actually have more in common than in conflict with one another, that in fact there is a shared narrative, and that there are responsibilities to being a citizen as well as rights 
of being a citizen. And most important, I think we all have to do something that is very, very difficult. We have to pay attention, but we also have to find a way to get out of our tribes and out of our bubbles. One of the things I do is I write for conservatives and I talk to liberals, and it's quite a trip.、Um, but what you find when you get outside your bubble is that, and you might actually like this, because you find there are interesting people out there with interesting perspectives, and they may not be what you expect. You might even learn to trust them, which is a good thing. Benjamin Franklin said the founding fathers had given us a republic. If you can keep it, so let's live up to that challenge as citizens.